Good morning and welcome everyone. Afternoon, whatever time of day it is. Glad you're spending this hour with us. We have it just a couple more seconds as people find their way in. Thank you all for joining us for this hot topic. We had close to 200 registrants today, so excited um, to walk you through with one of our staff experts, a topic in hot demand right now. What's the future of the bike industry? Looking forward to sharing that with you today. All right, well, as people continue to find their way in, I wanna make sure we get the most out of our time together. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Kyler. I'm with People for Bikes as our state and local policy analyst. Um, and you're here at our second March segment in our monthly industry webinar series. This um, week, we're gonna be talking about an exciting new member benefit, which People for Bikes has made available on its member center to all of our coalition members, the Global Risk and Opportunity Forecast. It's produced by S&P Global. And the goal is to help the bike industry understand what headwinds and tailwinds are gonna affect our business over the next five years. It's a very detailed view of sales forecasts, supply chain risks and macroeconomic conditions across the globe. So I want to make notes, um, but we will send out a recording and copy of the slides and other resources to everyone who registered today. Um, we'll have an hour together, as I mentioned, the first 45 minutes or so, um, our presentation and the final 10 to 15 are gonna be Q&A. So please do remember to use that Zoom Q&A feature in the bottom of your screen so that our Patrick, our, whoop, our panelist, Patrick, <laughs> um, can be ready to answer those and they're first in the queue when we get to that portion. So um, not to tease that too much, but I'm excited to pass it off in a moment to Patrick Hogan, my esteemed colleague, and we can pop it to the next slide. Um, he is our wizard for all things research and data here at People for Bikes. Um, he's behind those monthly self reports that many of you receive for sales and other inventory trends. For those of you who are lucky enough to be on our research and stats industry-wide subcommittee, you know that he leads that, um, and as well as our business intelligence hub with tons of current and historical data going several years back. So I'm thrilled he's gonna be leading us in today's content. And Patrick, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kylie. That was that was perfect. I don't know that I've been introduced as a wizard before, but I love it. I'm gonna start um, using that. <clears throat> Um, thanks, everyone, for spending your morning or early afternoon with us here. I'm excited to talk about our global risk and opportunity forecast. Um, and I also want to extend a thanks to everyone who attended the BLC in Dana Point a few weeks ago and saw like a, a kind of sneak preview of this product. Um, but also everyone in that room, I think, got a lot of information really, really fast. And my goal with today's webinar is to slowly walk through the report's contents and describe how the results can be used to make decisions for your organization. Um, so again, I am Patrick Hogan. I am the Senior Research Manager at People for Bikes. Um, my day-to-day -day role is that I direct and I oversee all of our studies of participation, of sales, of consumer insights data um, to help our industry know everything there is to know about bikes and bicycling. I also serve as the staff lead on our research and stats subcommittee, which I like to lovingly describe as a group of 20 to 25 of the nerdiest folks throughout the industry that come together to direct the research, which People for Bikes and I ultimately engage in. So just a quick agenda. Um, we're gonna go over um, the background of the report, why we engaged in this research effort, we're going to walk through the report backwards because it would be no fun if we were just walking through the report forwards. Um, and then we have time for questions at the end. So please, as we're going through, there, there's still going to be a lot of information coming at you today. Please feel free to use the Q&A function as something pops up, and then we can circle back and answer that question once we reach the Q&A portion. So the Research and Statistics Subcommittee came up with the idea to, to create some sort of product that would help us understand what's heading our way. Um, I think once we all kind of caught our breath after 2021, we realized that we need some sort of forward-facing data resource that would help us look out and, and see any threats or opportunities looming on the horizon that we might be able to expect, and then we can navigate around those, um, those bumps in the road or those tailwinds. 
So we called the project our global risk and opportunity forecast, and we distributed a request for proposals, an RFP, and ultimately decided to move forward with S&P Global as the research group which would conduct the research. Uh, we were thoroughly impressed with their approach and the resources which they would devote to conducting the research. Um, but as you may now be able to guess, the name of the product is a bit funny because we're working with S&P Global to produce the global risk and opportunity forecast. And so we, we didn't want to call it the S&P Global, global risk. You get it. Um, anyway, so we had a group, S&P Global. Now we need the expertise. Uh, we created this round table experience for a cross section of the research and statistics working group to come together and help S&P Global understand how the bike industry operates, where we operate, what, um, what factors affect our ability to operate effectively. Uh, so the S&P Global is a, a worldwide leader in research. Um, we think that we're the worldwide leader in the US bicycle market. And so together we had um, really open and frank discussions about how each of our businesses operate and, and what we depend on in order to be effective in the marketplace. And this group also serves as the first line of defense. So uh, when S&P Global presents us with a report, um, those reports go to that group before they go to PFB membership just to make sure that it, um, it, it resonates with us, it meets our expectations, we don't see any issues with it, and then provide a stamp of approval of sorts um, so that when we do provide that resource this this quarterly report to our members um our our subcommittee can stand behind it with confidence so we had s p global contracted due to the work we had the industry expertise and the third component we needed was the historic data upon which s p global could build their models and that's where our existing uh, pfb member benefits came into play the sell-through data from circana previously named npd group they changed their name a few weeks ago. So as we go through the next hour together, I'm certain I'll stumble and accidentally call them NPD, but they're now Circana. Um, those sell-through data are the foundation upon which the market forecasts have been built. And I'll maybe I'll suggest that foundation is a bad metaphor because uh, it will grow and change as we fill data gaps like um, getting an understanding of how many bikes are being sold directly to consumers, how many bikes how many electric bicycles are going through e-bike specialty dealers, that sort of thing. Um, so while it's built on that foundation of existing Circana sell-through data, it's going to grow as we fill in those data gaps. Um, and a few more quick notes. The goal of today's webinar is to introduce this product in like a 101 manner. Uh, we're going to review the contents of the reports and describe how it could potentially affect the way our organizations make decisions. If you have any questions that go beyond the 101 level, um, feel free to shoot me an email afterwards so that we can reserve our time today to like lay that foundation of a basic understanding. Um, and then one last thing, because People for Bikes is serving as the industry trade association, all of this work is focused on the industry level. We want to provide as much information as possible to all of our members. And for this reasons, the conclusions may be a little bit general, uh, but that's because we want to do everything possible to serve the industry as a whole and, and sort of be that tide that lifts all boats. So let's get into it. Uh, like I said, we're going to go backwards through this report because a webinar that reads forward to backwards is no fun. We're going to we're going to reverse it. Uh, first, I want to go over the supply chain risk analysis portion of the report. So we all know that our supply chain went through some changes through 20 and 21. We had some difficulties. We had some breakdowns, um, and there are a lot of a lot of components within our supply chain that are outside of our realm of control. Uh, we know that stay-at-home orders and lockdowns abroad halted our production, delays at ports of entry dis disrupted our timelines for delivery, um, and th there's a lot of pieces, parts of our supply chain that ultimately affect our ability to make, to transport, and then to sell our products. So. While these factors are, are still out of our control, understanding what threats and opportunities exist on the horizon can help us better optimize our timeline subject to those constraints. So like I mentioned, we had a like a round table discussion with the research and stats subcommittee and with S&P Global to understand where the bike industry operates. And we identified six countries of interest. Oh no, I think we cut off the bottom of the map here. That's okay. 
Um, those countries include China, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam, highlighted here. Um, and while it may be the case that some of our members, um, some of your organizations may operate outside of these countries, we identified these as the most relevant to the industry as a whole, and we focused our efforts here. Um, and, and the goal of this portion of the report is to understand what geopolitical events, what environmental factors, what social factors might affect our ability to produce in an area or might affect our ability to get product from that area to the US. So it manifested in, um, in this form. This is actually a page from our PDF report. This is an example of the country specific detail included in the quarterly report. So S&P Global has hundreds of economists stationed ac across the globe um, that provide their on the ground analysis to our project manager, who then synthesizes the information and distills it into the most pertinent information for our industry focus for the bike industry. Um, so we can see how political stability, safety of our cargo, geopolitical events, environmental concerns, and myriad other factors can affect our business in a given country. Um, and so here you can see this was produced last month um, and we can see how, how the alleged Chinese spy balloon incident could affect our relationship with China and ultimately affect our ability to operate um, or um, conduct business with factories operating in China, for instance. Um, lots of detail in here specific to how these events will affect or could potentially affect the bike industry for China and then also for Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. And all of these, um, all of the bullet points there are really just like the executive summary. It's the most important factors that we need to consider if we're um, critiquing our supply chain and trying to understand where um, where opportunities exist for improving our, our resiliency and where we might um, have a, a threat to our supply chain that could disrupt our business. So we talked briefly about events in other countries affecting our supply chain. Let's switch to an analysis of our domestic econ <clears throat> economy, excuse me, and how the macro US economy could affect our markets. Um, Macroeconomic analysis. So, so we want to understand how all of the um, all the events in the in the national economy are affecting the bike industry. Things like unemployment, home affordability, gross domestic product, overall retail sales in the market. What what are other markets doing that are affecting our market? Um, public policy. We know um, there are policies at the federal, state, and local level that affect our ability to sell bikes that could create incentives for consumers to purchase our bikes. Uh, but at the same time, we know that American consumers have more credit card debt now than at any point, I think in the last 15 or 20 years, I forget what the number is. So the S&P Global provides um, top line macroeconomic analysis to help us understand which of these factors are important for us to key into or um, important for us to focus on as we're establishing a baseline for our own forecasting abilities. What, what actually matters to us when we're trying to figure out if sales are gonna go up, if sales are gonna go down, if they're gonna be stagnant. This again is a, a page straight from the report. This is a, um, <clears throat> the most pertinent information for our industry to consider as we gauge our expectations for the near term and the midterm markets. So each of these factors, disposable income, interest rates, um, all affect the bike industry's market, as we'll see in the market forecast. Um, and I, I'll just read the first one here. We expect the U.S. economy to experience a mild recession starting in the first quarter of 23, with recovery beginning in the third quarter. The U.S. economy had an unexpected strength in the fourth quarter of 22 when GDP grew 2.9%, raising the output level entering 23. But we expect a 0.7% real GDP growth in 23, measured year over year. So I mentioned these reports are quarterly. Um, each of these macroeconomic findings are updated quarterly too, so that you know it, it has been the case for like a year now that economists all think that we're just barely 
not in a recession that will will like tip over into a recession. We'll have two quarters of negative GDP in a row. Um, and we keep navigating around that somehow. So this is the this page in the report will always represent our best guess for what's going to happen based on all of these other economic indicators, both within the US and outside of the US and uh, microeconomic indicators of consumer spending and macroeconomic indicators of inflation rates. So as as we go through reports and as we we continue reporting quarter over quarter over quarter, um, we'll be revising these to, so it reflects the most current events. And like we we know that economics is a social science. It's not a it's not a hard science. There's no exact answers. We can't say with 100 percent certainty that we know exactly what inflation rates are going to do tomorrow. I don't think Jay Powell knows what inflation rates are going to do tomorrow. Um, so there's confidence intervals around everything we do. We are forecasting to the best of our abilities, but there are still factors that we can't account for um, and some factors that will have uncertain effects. So in addition to our macroeconomic analyses, S&P Global has presented these, these push and pull factors, these upwards and downwards pressures um, that could affect our markets. So these factors represent potential headwinds coming our way, which may or may not affect our, our business. Um, so for instance, GDP could decline more sharply than expected. Unemployment could bump up in response to the continued increase in interest rates, which is what that increase in interest rates is supposed to do, but it hasn't really done yet. Um, so we, we expect like a one in four probability that these factors would push down our expectations and we'd actually have a worse market for selling bikes. But at the same time, there's a one in five chance that some of these upside opportunities could positively affect our market. Um, these opportunities detailed here represent the potential tailwinds which we could expect to enjoy. Um, if, if unemployment could stay low, GDP could continue to grow and household incomes could also grow, we would expect a better market for our bike sales. Um, and, and yeah, all, all of these scenarios which we could expect with a one in five chance could positively affect our near-term and mid-term future states. So that takes us into what those future states actually look like. And before we get into graphs and charts and numbers, um, a, a few quick notes. These models are all built on existing sales data from Circana, previously in PD Group. And as such, they the market forecasts are all specific to the retail market. Um, that's the that's the most comprehensive view that we have right now. Um, and so those data are the best that we have to work with um, and, and the best that S P can use to forecast sales. So we've prioritized research in the direct to consumer market and the used bike market to better understand like the the whole comprehensive world of US bicycle sales. And as those data come online, we'll be looking to fold those into the analysis here. But for now, the explicit focus of this work is the retail market, which includes both IBDs, so our, our specialty independent bike dealers, and the rest of market, which includes uh, mass. So those are Targets and, and Walmarts and Kmarts. Um, it includes outdoor specialties. So that would be Academy, Sports and Outdoors, Dick Sporting Goods, those sorts of, of retailers. Um, online marketplaces such as Amazon.com, Backcountry.com. Really, it's any retailer who's not an independent bike dealer. But again, the limit here is it's all retail. Um, okay, forecasting. So this work is all based on econometric theory. Uh, the, the goal of this work is really to let the data speak. Um, s and Global is modeling these markets based on their expertise as economists, not as bicycle industry experts, but um, the benefit of working together with the research and stats subcommittee is that we're able to draw upon the expertise of our bicycle industry experts to help inform these models, which, uh, which are very black and white. You know, they, they take inputs and they produce outputs. So these models incorporate short-term trends like interest rates, housing prices, disposable income, long-term trends like demographic shifts and, and um, the, the distribution of age as, as we look at youth bikes uh, depends a lot on 
or uh, youth bike sales depends a lot on how many youth there are to, to ride kids' bikes. And then there's other qualitative trends. There's mushier trends. They're a little bit harder for us to quantify. Um, trends in bicycling safety, advances in bike technology, and then you know it, any changes to access and, and regulations that affect bicycling and the similar um, similar sorts of effects are typically going to be captured in in like an error term. So we'll we'll see that in a sec. Um, we know that. These factors affect the U.S. retail sales of bikes, but they don't affect every category in the same way. Um, so within bikes, you know, every category we think is distinct, but there are a few that are particularly heterogeneous. Um, it Because it, it's not the same that all bikes are interchangeable, but within a, a certain window, some, some groups of categories operate like other groups and are dependent upon the same factors. So with this understanding, the market forecasts are broken out into a few distinct categories. We have electric bikes, kids' bikes, adult non-electric bikes, which is really everything that's not electric and everything that's not kids. And we also forecast um, parts and accessories. And these are all affected by different trends and therefore they're given different forecasts. Uh, so a few more qualifications before we, we jump into charts. Um, the best econometric models are simple, like, <laughs> which which seems counterintuitive because when when we first start model, modeling, the the instinct is usually to to throw lots and lots of variables at it and and build it up and build it up and build it up. But typically, we can explain most of the variation in a dependent variable. So in this case, uh, unit sales with four or five or six variables. And Lastly, S&P Global is an expert in econometric analysis. They don't have the biases that a lot of us have, and I'm going to put myself in that category. Um, many of us who've worked at bike shops have our own theories about how short-term weather trends, like a few weeks of rain or an early summer warming, could affect our bike sales. And when we ditch these, these biases and, and we really let the data speak for themselves, SMB Global has been able to produce some really strong models, um, having tested all of those variables and seeing how they actually explain the variation in unit sales. They've stuck with the models that work the absolute best um, and have the, the strongest ability to explain the, the changes in sales. So um, all that to say, uh, that's not to say that any of us are incorrect for, for thinking, you know, like, if you were to ask me what I think bike sales are dependent on, I'd, I'd say a lot of things like gas prices and weather and some of the things that that those of us in the bike shop wondering why sales aren't coming in through the door um, might be talking about. But letting the data speak for themselves and um, and really building these strong econometric models has been the goal of this this project. And um, anyway, all, all that to say, we we've let the data speak first. And all of these models have been built with the expertise of the research and stat subcommittee um, as well. So let's advance the slide. Here we go. Um, we forecast three bike market segments separately, and then we add them together to understand the total projected or the total forecasted unit sales for bicycles. So we have kids bikes here as the base with this red column, adult non-electric bikes in gray, and then electric bikes is the, the tiny black sliver at the top, which then grows as we approach the future. Um, the market bottomed out in like mid-22 as higher sales numbers were reported for the second half of the year. Um, there was unexpected strength in the overall economy as, as U.S. Um, consumers were like just stubborn in, in our desire to continue buying, even though we don't have money and even though we're going into credit card debt. Um, sales are expected to grow in 23 and 24 before sort of converging and plateauing towards this long run path around 4 million bikes a quarter, which is the, the time unit here. These are, these are quarterly estimates. Um, again, all just retail sales. I, I'll probably say that 10 or 20 more times before the end of the the webinar just to make sure that we're all still on the same page that this is retail sales. Um, so kids bikes will continue to lead sales and numbers. Again, this is all in units. Uh, and the share of e-bikes is projected to increase 
as consumers maybe substitute away from non-electric bikes and e-bikes reach a new audience that, that had not previously been bicycling. Um, there's a strong statistical relationship between the retail bike market and household affordability measured by an affordability index of the median priced single family home. Um, home affordability is expected to recover in 23 and 24 due to lower house prices and mortgage rates supporting bicycle sales. And so that's, for example, one of the factors why we expect this, um, I'm going to get my cursor over here, this increase here in 23 and 24. Um, and then after 24, our forecast for the bike market is driven by more steady, long-term demographic forces. Uh, and then just to, to sort of ground ourselves in some data that, that we might have all seen before, um, I positioned the, the previous graph next to import data from the USITC. This is non-electric bikes. Um, and as we see this gray portion of adult non-electric bikes sort of continue to decrease here, it, it's a little bit um, striking to see it presented in the way that it is in the S&P report, but, but it agrees with what we've seen from the U.S. import data. Uh, this is from 2020 up to 21. Uh, so, so just a triangulation point would be that um, it's it, sort of a, a business as, as usual. S&P Global isn't presenting us with any forecasts that aren't based on trends that we, we've already become uh, familiar with. Uh, so a, a few data points to consider. We know that according to our 2022 U.S. bicycling participation study, which I've linked at the, the end of this presentation, there were more Americans ages three and older who rode a bike in 22 than in any other year we've ever, ever measured going back to 2014. There are more people riding bikes in the U.S. than ever before. So in many years, there's this really strong correlation between sales and ridership. But in 20 and 21, that, that correlation was disrupted a bit as um, existing riders were buying additional bikes. And as we saw demand sort of pulled forward, if we think of a rider typically replacing their bike every four to six years, which is what the majority of cyclists do, um, that replenishment cycle was was disrupted in 20 and 21 when there were fewer opportunities to engage in other outdoor rec pursuits, when we had fewer opportunities for leisure time, and we had uh, government stimulus checks. There, there were a bunch of push and pull factors that we think created this bump in sales here in 20 and 21, um, which sort of drove a wedge between the correlation of sales and participation. So this graph isn't predicting that folks are not riding anymore. It's, it's predicting that um, macroeconomic factors will will yield fewer unit sales um, in, in the coming years. But it, it could mean that sales are shifting to the direct market, bypassing retail um, channels as more brands are selling directly to consumers. It could mean that folks are replacing their bikes less often as advanced technology makes it possible to ride a bike further and longer. Um, and it could mean that Americans do see themselves, this is the case, do see themselves more as outdoors people who camp, hike, fish, and ski in addition to riding a bike. And those other activities are increasingly competing for the same discretionary income within a household. Um, so specifically adult non-electric bikes, um, outside the pandemic frenzy of 20 and 21, the historical trend for this market has been a slight decline. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and our, our models expect this downward path to continue over the forecast horizon. Um, some of the factors be behind this downward trend are behavioral, including preferences, um, including factors like safety concerns, lack of safe places to ride, um, and the price effect of selling prices becoming more and more expensive. As, as we're all aware, um, there are a lot of factors that drove prices up in 2021 as shipping became increasingly more expensive, as it was lots of conflating factors driving those, those prices up, um, and that's negatively affecting our, our unit sales. Um, and then some, a, a few other factors to consider again is that this is just new bikes, there's no used bikes in here, and it's just retail sales, there's no direct to consumer bikes. Um, kids bikes, so kids are a much lower price point 
um, and kids have a much quicker replenishment rate, those, those uh, parents who are buying a kid's bike for their child will typically upgrade it every two to three years or so, depending on where that child is and their growth. Um, and so we do expect those two factors to be an important reason as to why we, we would see this rebound so quickly. Um, in addition, home affordability uh, would positively affect bicycle sales in 23 and 24. And so for that reason, we see this, this bump in 23 and 24 uh, being the, the first category to recover pretty quickly. And then in the longer term, the path for kids' bike sales will um, sort of plateau in, in the middle here um, between mid-2010s and this pandemic boost. Electric. So, so this is, um, I get a lot of questions about what we expect for electric bike sales, where electric bike sales are right now. Um, and this is the market which we know the least about. Um, there are more electric bicycles sold in the direct-to-consumer market um, than any other category sells in the direct-to-consumer market. And so our, our data gap here is the most limiting for us because we, we just don't have an idea what happens outside of retail. Um, and, and even then, within the retail channel, our strength is with independent bike dealers. And the rest of market, our strength is not in measuring e-bike-only dealers, those, those shops which might just be selling e-bikes and other e-mobility um, products. So the, the forecasts are based, again, on the Circana, previously NPD sell-through data. Uh, and as we get more direct-to-consumer data online, we're going to bring that into this model to help inform our forecasting. But for now, a lot of our expectations are built from learning about the European market and the Asian market and, and using that to, to kind of create this runway for what we expect electric bicycles to do in the U.S. market. Um, so we expect this parabolic trend to continue, similar to what's been seen in the European market. Um, and we, let's see, we, assuming that the U.S. market for e-bikes follows the European market with a multi-year lag, we expect e-bike sales to continue growing substantially in the years ahead. Uh, and then some, some factors that could affect this trend include um, changing price points, concerns about safety on the road, concerns about safety related to batteries, um, and then other legislation as it relates to access and incentives and um, all the conversations that I'm sure we're all keenly aware of as, as we're plugged into the bike industry. And lastly, um, service and parts. I, I mislabeled this as parts and accessories, but it should be service and parts. Um, so this is bike rentals, repairs, tires, tubes, components, um, wheels, saddles, et cetera. Um, this is mostly based on sales of new bikes um, with, with a few additional factors in there. But for the most part, we're gonna see this track along just as we see um, new bike sales, that, that adult non-electric and the kids' bike market. Um, changes in those two markets will affect our expectations for services and parts. So that's um, those are the, the static graphs which are presented in the report, which are helpful for us to like get a quick understanding of what we think uh, electric bikes are going to do in the next few years. But if I'm a data scientist working at a member organization at a, at a bike supplier, let's say, I want to know what it means for me. And I want to like dig into what's behind these graphs. So in addition to the like 40 or 50 page PDF, which we produce every quarter for our members, there's a data dashboard uh, which accompanies this. So I'm going to jump over to that PDF within the report. In the appendix, there's a hyperlink that says find the data dashboard linked here. And it will download straight to our computer. And I'll pull it up here so that we can all walk through it together. Um, this is all of the modeling that goes into creating those graphs and those charts within the static PDF. And this is where um, a, a savvy data person can really find a lot of value. This describes what um, inputs each of the models are using. If we unhide, of course, it's giving me trouble while I'm on a recorded webinar. If we unhide 
model specifications, descriptions of the drivers, and the actual driver data, we can see the STATA output for our electric bicycle forecasts so that if we wanted to understand, if, if we worked in an e-bike supplier and wanted to, to plug in our sales, our quarterly sales data instead of the NPD sales data, we could see how these same independent variables are affecting our, our total sales. Um, so these are the STATA output. Each of these, this is all gibberish. This doesn't make sense to anyone. But if we take this over to the next tab, this is the description of each of those variables included in a given model. So let's stick with e-bikes. Uh, real consumer spending on other recreational goods and vehicles. Here's a description of the data. And the source of the data, SP Global themselves actually produce that data point. The Bureau of Economic produces pricing effect data. Um, the US Census Bureau produces data relative to um, population and age. Um, so each of these models contain, um, like I said, four or five, six different variables plus an error variable that helps us account for some of those unexplainable, unmeasurable factors like sentiment, like perceptions of safety, um, that sort of thing. And then if we wanna dig even further down into the actual values, um, it, if we think, you know, like I, I have my own hunch on what I think home affordability is gonna be in a given period, I can come in here and change some of these data and I can see how that would affect our expectation for sales in a given time period later down the road. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of flexibility to take these, um, take these models sort of as a starting point and then build from there to create our forecasts. So this is produced every quarter along with that static PDF and it's updated every quarter so that we're constantly bringing in the most current data to reflect all of these independent variables and the most current sales that we have through our Circana data and we're constantly adjusting it to create uh, the forecast which we have the greatest confidence in. Um, and again, these, these last few tabs include all of the, um, all of the graphs which we uh, which represent the four markets, the adult non-electric kids, electric, and then service and parts. So let's come back this way. Um, so again, the data dashboard can only be accessed through that PDF, which is in the member center. Um, there's a hyperlink right in the appendix, and that'll download it straight to our computer. Um, ideally, we'll have that up on the member center too, so that we can you can just download it straight from the member center instead of having to go into the PDF 30 pages into a 40 page document and find a hyperlink. Um, so as soon as we have that change, uh, we'll we'll update our members. But for now, oh, let's get back to our presentation. Um, this report is contained in the People for Bikes Member Center, which is linked here. So when you receive these slides after the presentation, you'll be able to just click this link, which will take you to the People for Bikes corporate member login for our member center. You'll enter your email address and it'll send you a six digit code that you have to use to do the two factor or two step authentication. We have to do it every time. It makes me do it too. <laughs> and that gets us into the member center, which has a banner here for our S&P Global Risk and Opportunity Forecast. Um, and the naming convention for this requires a month and a year. So you'll see February 23. Really what that means is that this is the Q1 23 report and we're, we're working to change that so that this reflects Q4 22, Q1 23. And then here's what it looks like. So there's an executive summary at the beginning of each of these, uh, which tries to synthesize all of the data in this huge document to just what's important for us to know. Like if we just have two or three minutes, there's an overview and there's a couple of top line findings here in addition to two or three points from each of these countries of interest, our, our six countries, China, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, what's happening in these countries that we need to know in order to better 
um, situate our supply chain to make sure that we're able to, to optimize our sales. And then, as I said, the, the report flows opposite of the, the flow of my presentation, um, but it goes through those market forecasts, macroeconomic trends are right here in the middle, and then country-specific supply chain risk analyses. In, in a, a detailed appendix with data output and model descriptions. Um, so a, a few parting thoughts before we, we switch over to Q&A. <clears throat> People for Bikes is working to make the US the best place in the world to ride a bicycle. Um, we are working to create safer places to ride by expanding infrastructure and facilities expanding access for bikes of all types by ensuring bike-friendly policy can be enacted at the federal, state, and local level. And we're working to increase participation of all types of bicycling. So our goal is to do whatever we can do to turn some of those negative trends that we described in previous slides into positive trends, right? Like there, there are some trends that are heading downwards, and that may have been the case for years and years, but um, we're still committed to making the U.S. the best place in the world to ride a bike. We know that participation and sales aren't perfectly correlated such that a decline in sales means there are fewer people riding bikes. Um, but still, uh, that that's our those are our goals. That's our, our raison d'etre. And um, lastly, this is an ongoing project. So just like our work with Circana and NPD, um, there's always opportunities to fine tune this. So please shoot me an email to ask if we can expand it in a certain direction if we can get more detail about a particular part of the market, um, our goal is to really provide you, our members, with as much data as possible so that we can all navigate uncertain markets. And I depend on this feedback loop to understand how we can finally tune it to meet your needs. Um, that doesn't mean that we'll always be able to do it, um, but please let us know what we can do to, to adjust this in a way that would make it more helpful. And again, these reports are, are available quarterly uh, in the PFB Member Center. So I've, I've got a link here, which will take you straight to that portion of the member center. And then I also have links to everything else that we've talked about here. Um, this is the, the general landing page from the member center. Our business intelligence hub uh, brings together participation data, sales data, and consumer insights data that are typically reported on a weekly or a daily basis for our like quick understanding of what's happening in the market right now in like near real time. Uh, we have participation research on the hub or on the on the member center as well, including the 22 bicycling participation study, which I mentioned found that more Americans are riding a bike in 22 than ever before. Um, Physical Activity Council uh, single sport reports, which describe uh, participation in road biking, mountain biking, indoor cycling, BMX, and then an archive of sales research. So everything um, dating back to mid. 2018 from Circana slash NPD group. And then we also have smart detailing data, US import data, and then weekly Circana data on the business intelligence hub linked here. So lots of links, lots of places to, um, to go beyond just this report. Uh, but let's circle now over to Q&A. Perfect. I, I kept it to 44 minutes. My goal was 45. This is the first time it's ever worked out. Um, so we had a few questions submitted before the webinar, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer one of those now so that we all have time to throw some questions in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's see. How could these concepts apply to strategic and SNOP sales inventory and operations planning? Um, okay, cool. Yeah. So so my expertise is at the industry level. Um, I've never had to make those decisions before, but let me. Let me answer it to the best of my ability. Um, I'd suggest the supply chain risk analysis could be leveraged to mitigate risk along our supply chain, or at least plan for disruption if we can't avoid it. If we know that um, there's issues getting cargo out of a certain area, or there's issues getting cargo into the U.S., um, knowing that that those issues are either looming on the horizon or that they're happening now and they may expect to worsen, or we could expect um, we could expect some relief soon. That's going to help us gauge our expectations for the future and adjust our sales and inventory um, accordingly. 
Macroeconomic analyses could help us understand which key indicators we should be listening to and then help us understand how our internal forecasts could be adjusted in response. So if you if you listen to um, any reports on on the economy, I listen to uh, NPR's marketplace every day and there's there's a lot of indicators that'll come up in conversation. but I think this report's really helpful in, in directing us to just the few that are really going to affect our business. And so it helps us kind of keep the blinders on. And as we're projecting our own sales and inventory forecasts, we we can be better tuned into what might actually affect our, in, our, our business instead of letting every different indicator um, sort of um, get us distracted from, from the meaningful work of, of creating our forecasts. Um, and then the, the sales forecast can help us set realistic long-term goals for the retail market, for, for our particular niche of the market, for our particular business. Um, perfect. Let me let me scroll through some of these questions here. How close do we think we'll get on the 23 forecast from the original uh, first revision? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I mentioned we had a, a Q4 22 report, um, which we we failed to like uh, promote as much awareness of. So uh, I, I don't think a lot of folks use that very much, but if you're interested in going back and looking at that late 22 estimate for what Q1 23 was going to be, you'll notice that it's very different. And that's because we, <clears throat> I say we, but, but most U S economists expected um, a worse holiday shopping season than we actually had. We expected consumers to react rationally and we reacted irrationally. And, and by that, I mean that we continued to spend more, we continue to drive ourselves into debt, even though interest rates and, um, and household, like real household income indicated that we should have spent less and it should have been, uh, we, we should have seen fewer bikes being sold. So as such, um, we, we didn't expect the same recession to hit in early, uh, early Q1 23. And so our forecast is more optimistic now than it was a few months ago when we produced our first first estimate in, in late 22. So again, it, it's a social science. We're constantly learning and growing and building in or, or bringing in the most relevant up-to-date data that we can. And, um, and you'll see in the details of this report that it's called out that that particular change positively affected our expectation for 23 and then 24 as well. Okay, the report tracks retail sales, not D2C sales, uh, yet Amazon was mentioned. Are D2C sales separated from retail sales when uh, reporting Amazon's data? Yes. So <clears throat> Amazon has a lot of different ways to sell, and I'm not an expert on that, um, but I can say that the, the third-party Amazon platform sales are not in there, um, but but pure retail Amazon sales are included in the sell through product. That, that's my understanding. If um, I can't see who wrote that, but if you can shoot me an email, let me hook you up with our Circana folks and they might be able to provide a, a more precise answer for that one. Cause I'm not, there, there's so many different ways the Amazon platform can be used for, um, for used for third party and then for retail. I'm not exactly clear on how those um, align with our, our data gathering. Uh, does the kids' bikes data get segmented into more detailed categories? For example, starter bikes versus high-end, um, road versus mountain. Those those are not included. So it, again, our our limit here is that we're trying to produce um, a really large pool of information to provide the entire industry with, and as such, we don't we don't have the ability to go really deep. Um, so adult non-electric, unfortunately, is is the limit of that. And kids, um, we don't have the ability to drill down into kids either. But I, I would say that we it's it's worth exploring the differences within those categories if we think um, that kids mountain might be different than um, balance bikes or, or something like that. <clears throat> At, at first glance, I would suggest that those markets probably move in the same direction, maybe with different magnitudes, but not in a way that would necessitate their own independent forecasts. But but still, um, 
we can we can explore some of those differences with s p global and, and see what opportunities exist even though we're currently not able to break those out in in our reporting structure uh beyond service and parts what about accessories as a forecast what do we think the forecast will track most closely to Ooh, that's a good question um yeah i we can we need to do more work in the accessories we, we'd originally just planned on this being for bikes but then parts and accessories so closely mapped to bicycle sales that we we thought we would include it too um what do we think that accessory sales most closely are correlated with? I, I would assume they operate a lot like parts and accessories, although um, I'm not totally sure. Let me let me follow up on that. That's a great question. Um, do all PFB members have access to the data? Any fees beyond membership dues? I'm so glad that we got that question. Yes, all PFB members have access to the data. Uh, this is what your membership dues pay for. So. Um, in exchange for becoming a valued member of People for Bikes, you have access to everything that we have access to. Um, so all of these data, all of the monthly NPD reports or uh, Circana reports, I did it. I knew I was going to do it. Um, everything in our member center is available as a member benefit at no extra charge. Um, and, and furthermore, if there's anything that you think may be like behind this report, any of the raw data, which are used as inputs or anything like that, um, all of this work we're able to do because we have 300 plus valued members of our coalition. Um, and so your, your membership dues paid for it and your membership, you're uh, able to access every level of detail which we have access to. Perfect, I, I think that might be all the questions. Um, Patrick, there are two okay. that were chatted into us. If you open oh, the no. chat. Okay. Um, and but please yeah. keep coming in. We want to make sure that we max out the hour if you have still have questions. What are my thoughts on how to reverse the predicted downward trend in sales? <clears throat> um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I will say that in the 22 participation study, we measured a continued decrease in youth participation rates. And it's not a dramatic decrease, but it is statistically significant that it's like one or two percent um a, a decline of one or two percent every two years we we run this study every two years and, and even years um since we started measuring back in 2014 um and and so i would i would suggest that getting more kids on bikes and creating a, a much wider base of this population pyramid of cyclists is certainly a way to get folks aware of cycling as a fun healthy recreation activity and as a, as a great alternative to um, other transportation methods if we're considering how to get from point A to point B. Um, creating awareness, interest, motivating young riders um, that supports a, a population of riders that will you know grow cycling in the US and that also supports the retail market and our sales market, our, our like greater US market for bikes. Um, shooting from the hip that's going to that's going to be my answer is is that uh, investing in youth participation and getting kids excited about riding bikes is one of the long-term plays that we have to get uh, more people on more bikes more often and also to get more people in our shops buying more bikes um, next question how can this data help to determine growth rates in specific price ranges Ooh, that's good um yeah so so that's another limit here is that again we're we're super zoomed out so that we can describe the whole industry as opposed to just focusing on on one niche um we don't have the ability <laughs> excuse me um through our circana monthly sales data our, our sell through data um we don't have any price bands and so we don't have visibility into how different um specific price ranges are are selling or might be um in stocks at ibd inventories and we also therefore don't have the ability to forecast for particular price ranges. But um, you know, I I think some of those lower price categories, like the kids' bikes we saw rebounded really quickly or, or are expected to rebound quickly. Some of the really high end to um, some of those more avid customers who are spending tens of thousands of dollars on cycling equipment every year, they're more they're more resilient, they're less affected by some of those macroeconomic shifts that we see affecting the entire industry. 
those we I would expect to be more resilient, less likely to experience um, the peaks and troughs of, of the greater industry. And it's sort of those folks in the middle that I described as being cyclists, but also being hikers and skiers and campers and, and having other outdoor rec pursuits in addition to just other leisure activities that are competing for their discretionary income. Um, those those middle price ranges are um, are probably more susceptible to the peaks and troughs. And I see, yeah, there, there are price ranges available in Circana if an individual organization purchases data from Circana. <clears throat> People for Bikes doesn't have any of those data. So I have, um, I, I don't have any visibility there. And, and we also therefore like don't have the ability to bring those data into the S&P forecasts. Uh, simply as a result of our, our goal to provide as many categories as we can so that we're covering the breadth of all of our PFB members from complete bikes to parts and accessories to apparel to helmets and footwear and gloves. Um, it's cost prohibitive for us to be able to provide price band data too. And so I, I don't have that and we're not able to offer that to our members as a benefit, even though a lot of our members do purchase data directly from Circana. Um, have we seen the development of NICA influence the growth of the youth category? Would the downward trend be worse without NICA? That's a great question that I am not um, able to, uh, to speak to as I'm not our, our youth person. I'm not an expert in that area, but Nick Aguilera uh, is our youth cycling person. I'm forgetting his title and I'm I am embarrassed that I don't remember his exact title, but he works closely with NICA and a number of other similar organizations that are focused on getting kids on bikes and creating opportunities for kids to learn about bikes and become motivated to ride bikes. Um, all of those programs are are successful in, in their own ways, like with, with their own scope. Some of these programs are much more narrow in their scope. Some are much larger. NICA is a, a large program. Um, so yes, I, I can say with certainty that, that any of those programs are, are effective at getting kids excited about bikes and on bikes. Um, but maybe the question is like, how do we, how do we generate more growth and more excitement and more motivation that's going to get more kids on bikes? Um, I think NAC is a part of it, but I think there's a lot of other opportunities too. Perfect. Um, I think that's it. I think those are all the questions. So I'm going to transition to um, the thank you slide. So thanks everyone for spending an hour of your morning or of your early afternoon um, talking about macroeconomic sales or macroeconomic trends and forecasting. Everyone's favorite topic, I know. Um, I appreciate everyone's time this morning and everyone's thoughtful questions. The, these are um, the most relevant and um, and thoughtful questions that I've had out of webinar. So I, I appreciate everyone's um, interaction here. Again, I'm Patrick Hogan. I am your senior research manager at People for Bikes. Um, my email is patrick at People for Bikes. Uh, so please shoot me a question or research at People for Bikes if, you, if um, for whatever reason you can't find this email address. Uh, if you have any questions about this S&P Global work, about our work with Circana, or about any of the research that we're doing to track participation, sales, and consumer insights. Um, our goal is to know everything there is to know about bicycles and bicycling. So uh, we'd love to chat about research. And then I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Kyler, to, to take us home. Just another word of thank you, Patrick. Thank you to everyone else for joining. And a quick reminder to keep an eye out for our next, um, our invitation to our next um, monthly industry webinar in late April, talking about the tariff guide, everything you want to know about the latest and greatest in import regulation and uh, getting your product into the States to sell. So um, that's it. Talk to you in a few weeks. And Patrick, thank you again. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.